Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching a special edition of The Listening Post. When Barack Obama is sworn in for his second term in the White House, January 21st, he will be facing a list of unfulfilled promises that he made when he first ran back in 2008. One of them has to do with the treatment of whistleblowers, classified information, as well as the entrenchment of the national security state in the U.S. Just after his recent re-election, Obama signed the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. However, that legislation only goes so far. Whistleblowers are only protected if the information they disclose is not classified. It's an important distinction because between 2008 and 2012, the Obama administration charged twice as many whistleblowers, six, under the Espionage Act for the alleged mishandling of classified information than all past presidential administrations combined. Only one of those names is well known. It's Private Bradley Manning, the alleged source of classified documents that ended up on WikiLeaks. This continuing story has implications in the areas of defense, intelligence, and national security, among many others. We're going to examine the impact it has had on U.S. journalism because when sources dry up, reporters and the news outlets they work for end up with fewer stories, and Americans, as a result, know less about what their government is doing in their name. In part two of our program, a feature interview with a lawyer who works to protect whistleblowers. First, though, what's at stake when you come forward on an issue relating to national security in Barack Obama's America? The whistleblowers, in many respects, are the canaries in the government coal mine. The Obama administration is extremely sensitive to national security issues, and the question is why? If you are a person who's seen government wrongdoing, what do you do? In the eyes of the Obama administration, if you give classified information to a reporter, you are not a whistleblower. You are a felon, period. In its pursuit of Americans blowing the whistle on matters relating to national security, the Obama administration is going way back to 1917. That is the year the U.S. Congress passed the Espionage Act, the law being used in these prosecutions. It's a World War I era statute. Um, it came out of a lot of hysteria. It was intended to go after spies, not whistleblowers. So to charge an American under the Espionage Act is pretty egregious. It paints them automatically as a traitor, a turncoat, an enemy of the state. Thomas Drake is no ordinary enemy of the state. He served in the U.S. Air Force and Navy, where he specialized in intelligence and eventually software. Later, Drake joined the NSA, the National Security Agency, which is tasked with the capture and analysis of foreign communications and is also responsible for the protection of American communications and information systems. Thomas Drake has been decorated three times for his work and prosecuted once. He believed that there was fraud, that there was abuse, there was mismanagement. He believed that the law was being violated and that people's information was being revealed and collected by the agency without um, the legal right to do so. He really did uh, epitomize uh, what you would probably want uh, a conscientious, committed, dedicated fellow employee to do uh, faced with uh, what really was turning out to be a boondoggle. But they went after him hammer and tong and, and accused him of essentially being a spy and releasing secret information for the purpose of harming the country. Thomas Drake blew the whistle on an NSA electronic surveillance program called Trailblazer. Launched in 2002 after the 9-11 attacks, Trailblazer was designed to search email and phone records. Drake says he told supervisors it was not only illegal and inefficient, it would prove to be, at a final cost of $1.2 billion, a colossal waste of taxpayers' money. He says his view was ignored, so he ultimately took the story to a newspaper, the Baltimore Sun. Drake then became one of six Americans charged under the Espionage Act. Among the others, John Kiriakou, a CIA analyst who spoke out on waterboarding under the Bush administration. Under Barack Obama, not a single American has been prosecuted for torture. But John Kiriakou will go to jail for two and a half years for talking about it and revealing the identity of a CIA operative. We're not just talking simple indictments. We're talking about indictment under one of the most egregious acts that you could charge an American with. So that begs the question, why? Right? Why would this administration be so aggressive? 
The answer to that question probably lies in the story of one of the whistleblowing six, Bradley Manning, the alleged source of the deluge of news that came to light through WikiLeaks. It would appear to be no coincidence that the rush of indictments started just after WikiLeaks was making big news in 2010. I have had people in the Obama administration tell me that immediately following WikiLeaks, there was, if not a directive, at least a sense among the intelligence agencies that there was going to be the equivalent of a zero tolerance policy for people who reveal classified information to the public. Because WikiLeaks indicated that these vast and growing oceans of secret information that the government is accumulating are uh, vulnerable to being released in unprecedented ways. And have everybody around the world download it. This completely freaked them out. And I can see that from their perspective, uh, shutting down a few people with non-essential secrets by making a spectacle of them uh, might have the, the beneficial effect of dampening down a potential that they're going to have a very hard time controlling otherwise. In defending its policy, the Obama administration argues it does protect whistleblowers when the information they reveal is not classified. Matthew Miller is the former director of public affairs at the U.S. Department of Justice. I see lots of people criticize the administration for conducting a so-called war on whistleblowers. But when you actually look at the facts of the cases, while you can argue about whether Thomas Drake was or was not a whistleblower, the other five indictments that have been brought, there really is no credible claim that they were exposing government wrongdoing or waste, fraud, and abuse. I think the phrase that people use, that this is a war on whistleblowers, really gives credit to people um, who don't deserve that credit. The people who endanger national security for no reason, certainly no genuine whistleblowing reason. I know from having sat through a meeting with the president, he is not inclined to extend whistleblower protections to people who have security clearances who reveal information that is classified. He and the rest of the people in the administration look at that type of release of information to the media and others uh, as being not a whistleblower situation, but rather a leak. The distinction between a leaker and a whistleblower is how inconvenient the leak is. And if it annoys the bureaucracy, they want to call it a leak and they refuse to give him the status of a whistleblower, which, which suggests that he's done something meritorious. But it doesn't address the core question, which is whether secrecy is being used excessively to keep information that belongs in the public domain away from the public. And this is the other distinction. Is it a legitimate public concern? We used to have much more robust public debate on issues of national security. But since post 9-11, the executive branch has said there's a privilege when it comes to national security. It's really not up for debate. We'll determine what that debate is. We will share the words of who you want you to hear and the public to hear. And just trust us that we're doing this in your best interest. Thomas Drake and the rest of the whistleblowing six have received very little coverage in the U.S. mainstream news media. The New York Times, the New Yorker magazine, and the Washington Post have all covered the Drake case, as well as some other papers. However, according to groups that protect whistleblowers, CBS is the only television news outlet to cover this issue through its investigative show, 60 Minutes. He's been charged under the Espionage Act and could spend the rest of his life in prison. My principal concern here is not with the Obama administration's actions. It is with the media's complicity and the media's submissiveness to them. And I'm shocked by how the media have failed to pick up the cudgels and to object to the fact that people are being treated very harshly, whose principal sin, as far as the media are concerned, is to provide them with information that the media believe is in the public's interest to know. Earlier this year, the Obama administration was asked about its record on whistleblowers. The White House press secretary was paying tribute to two American journalists who lost their lives in Syria when he was challenged by Jake Tapper of ABC News. It's a reminder of the incredible risks that journalists take in order to bring uh, the truth about what's happening in a country like Syria uh, to those of us at home. How does that square with the fact that this administration has been so aggressively trying to stop aggressive journalism in the United States by 
using the Espionage Act to, to, to take whistleblowers to court. You want aggressive journalism abroad, you just don't want it in the United States. Well, there are issues here that involve highly sensitive classified information. Tapper, ABC's White House correspondent, blogged about the exchange and the video was posted online. However, none of ABC's news broadcasts put the story on the air. We contacted ABC to ask why and received no response. The other factor in this news equation is technology. Gone are the days that prosecutors had to bring journalists into court to make their case against whistleblowers. Electronic surveillance has changed all that. One of the problems historically of prosecuting leak cases is there are only two people who know the source of a leak. The leaker who can take a Fifth Amendment and journalists who the administration, who historically administrations have been reluctant to, to subpoena. And so without one of those two people talking, there's no way to find out. Well, things are different now. People use email to leak sometimes. So with modern technology, you can make cases like this without having to resort to, to subpoenaing journalists. You talk to a journalist who in years past, going back 40 years, it would have said to you, if you talk to me, I will protect you. I will not reveal who you are. But just as technology is making our jobs easier, it is making the jobs of criminal investigators a lot easier too. And they are saying, you know what, you can promise them anything you want. We know who you're talking to. We don't have to subpoena you. We've got, we've got their phones under surveillance. We've got your credit card receipts. We've got your airplane tickets. We know what hotels you've been staying in. Um, we know everything about you. We, we have access to your email account. Don't think you can hide these people. Do not think you can ever protect them again. Coming up, an extended interview on blowing the whistle in America. But first, our Global Village voices on this issue. President Obama's track record on whistleblowing is mixed. In the private sector, for corporations, uh, there's been some advances. But for government workers, it's been horrendous. And it ensures that waste, fraud, abuse, and corruption are never reported. In the United States, we've been through about 30 years of deregulation in the finance sector, in food safety, in energy. So whistleblowers are really, in many ways, the last defense the public has in avoiding the exposure to excesses of the market. Jessalyn Radak knows the whistleblowing story from the inside out. She's a lawyer who worked as an ethics advisor for the U.S. Department of Justice. Remember John Walker Lind? He came to be known as the American Taliban. Back in 2001, Radak says she was just doing her job when she revealed that the FBI had questioned Lind illegally and that his so-called confession might not stand up in a court of law. She says she paid the price for that, that her bosses criticized her. The same supervisors who just a few months before had commended Radak for her job performance and given her a pay raise. A year later, she resigned. Jesslyn Radak has since written a book on the Lind case and now works as the National Security and Human Rights Director at the Government Accountability Project in Washington. The GAP is a non-governmental organization that defends whistleblowers, and Radak was one of the lawyers representing Thomas Drake when he was prosecuted. Jesslyn Radak spoke to me from our bureau in D.C. on what's happening to whistleblowers in America, the impact that has had on U.S. journalism, and what news organizations are doing about it, which, in her view, is not nearly enough. Jesslyn Radak, thanks for joining us here today at the Listening Post. I want to start with this. The Obama administration says that it draws a distinction between whistleblowers, those who expose fraud, mismanagement, and illegality in government, and leakers, those who expose secrets. As far as you're concerned, is there any merit to that argument? Yeah, I think there's definitely a distinction between whistleblowers who bring to light government illegality, fraud, waste, and abuse, and people who leak for no things of no public interest or no public value. Unfortunately, Obama has been going after the former category, in other words, whistleblowers. The biggest scandals that ha we've seen, in, certainly in my generation, um, for example, torture, rendition, drone attacks, targeted assassination of Americans, secret domestic surveillance, these things have been revealed by whistleblowers. The Abu Ghraib scandal is another example. 
these things are in the public right to know, and it's completely contrary to the idea of a democracy being free and open to be having this crackdown on people who are lawfully blowing the whistle. These are not people who are, who are giving out sources and methods. I'm not someone who is saying there should be no secrets. I think troop movements, intelligence, identities, um, I think that, that kind of stuff should be secret. I'm fine with that. But the kinds of things they're going after people for are not leaking secret information. They're, they're leaking illegal information that is often hidden behind a veneer of secrecy or classification um, or some other government um, label that they've chosen to attach to it. As far as you're concerned, is the real line here, the one that matters, that the Obama administration draws between national security and anything else that happens in the U.S. government? And if that is the de facto distinction, is that, in your view, a defensible policy? So far, that has definitely been a, a distinctive feature of these cases, is that they have to deal with national security and intelligence agencies. Um, but I don't think that is a, a very good distinction. Um, number one, because national security and intelligence employees have the fewest whistleblower protections. And number two, I would argue that they're the people you would most want to hear from if your airplane is not properly fixed or if there's going to be a nuclear spill or if the government is droning people in secret. Um, so it's ironic that that tends to be the group that are, that are being subject to these leak prosecutions. You've talked many times about how this administration has prosecuted more people under the Espionage Act, which is almost a 100-year-old piece of legislation than all successive administrations before it. But is it possible to know what kind of impact the prosecution of whistleblowers has had on American journalism? Or is that something that we'll just never know? No, I think already it's being felt. and. Some American journalists have talked about it publicly. Um, Jane Mayer, in her acceptance speech for the Polk Award, talked about it. Eric Lischblau of the New York Times talked about it. A few people have talked about the fact that it is sending a very chilling message not only to their sources, but to them as journalists. I think journalists should be much more worried than they are, because if their sor sources dry up, that's problem number one. But problem number two is that I think the administration is laying the groundwork with really bad precedent that can be used to go after them, to go after journalists themselves. And journalists' names appear throughout, throughout these various cases. They all have a journalism hook, and there's a reporter to whom someone supposedly leaked. So I don't know why there's this kind of cognitive disconnect between going after their sources and going after the actual journalist. It would definitely help if they would step up to the plate and really say this is unacceptable and really do more to expose it for what it is. What do you think is keeping them from doing that? Do you think it's an access issue? They fear that if they go after the administration on this issue, then the administration isn't going to feed them the news that they'd like to have access to in the future? Because that's been an issue in the past, hasn't it? Access. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the biggest leaker in the United States is the government. And the news reporters in the U.S. depend upon quote, authorized leaks by government officials on a daily basis. You cannot ever pick up a paper and not have multiple references, usually to anonymous government officials you know, whose name can't be used um, in the story because they're not authorized to talk about it, yet somehow uh, they get their story in the major papers. So of course, there's a, there's a cozy relationship there. And fear of losing access um, is not what should be stopping you. That's, your job is not to be the government's lapdog. Your job is to be the government watchdog. 
That's why journalists are referred to the fourth estate in the United States. And I think they also are operating under a fear of ticking off the U.S. government and becoming embroiled in these Espionage Act prosecutions. Yes. If mainstream news organizations aren't bringing this issue uh, to the level of prominence that you believe it deserves, what alternative news sources, websites, new media are actually talking about this uh, the way that you think it deserves to be uh, discussed? Interestingly, the blogosphere and international um, media outlets have been very interested in this issue. And I think part of it may be because of the glaring hypocrisy, um, especially with our efforts to spread democracy um, everywhere around the world, except in our own country, where we seem to be cracking down on a free and open democratic government and a free press. This is a personal issue for you, isn't it? Because you are a former whistleblower yourself. Can you give us an idea from your experience and from what you know about the people you've represented, the cases uh, to which you've just referred, what kind of cost these people end up enduring in a personal way? Sure, of course. Um, I have blown the whistle on prosecutorial misconduct um, in the interrogation, the government interrogation of John Walker Lind. And when I blew the whistle on the fact that this information had been withheld from the court, I ended up becoming the target of a federal criminal, quote, leak investigation. I ended up being referred to the state bars in which I'm licensed as an attorney based on a secret report to which I did not have access. And I was put on the no-fly list. As horrible as what I went through may seem and as absurd, the Obama administration has unfortunately taken it one step further. It is now actually prosecuting whistleblowers and they could face the rest of their life in jail. So typically, while people have to deal with being retaliated against work and fired and having security clearances pulled and being subject to bogus psychological exams and that sort of thing, it is up to the ante by an order of magnitude to actually be going after these people and with the very heavy-handed, completely out of scope Espionage Act. You're obviously committed to this issue. So is the organization you work for. So are the whistleblowers who you represent. But try as you might, getting journalists and news organizations as interested in this as, as you would like is proving to be very problematic. Therefore, getting the general po population interested in this matter is also proving very difficult for you. Is this a battle that you have already lost in America? I think it's a battle we're still fighting. I think just like privacy infringements in the war on terrorism, until it happens to you, you don't understand the full impact of what it means to have someone listening in to your phone conversations or monitoring your email. Um, people are like, I have nothing to hide. The government can monitor me. Well, guess what? When it actually happens, people have problems with that. And I think the media really should dig into what, what is driving Obama's war on whistleblowers. Is it that he wants to curry favor with the national security and intelligence establishments, which found him to be weak going into office. And I think journalists really need to be asking the government the hard questions of whether the intelligence agencies are driving this or whether people at the Justice Department are, drive, are driving this and why this president, who was elected on a platform of openness and transparency, is engaged in one of the worst crackdowns on public information that we've seen since the McCarthy era. Jesslyn Radak of the Government Accountability Project in Washington, thanks for talking to us today. Thank you. One closing note on the Thomas Drake case. He's the former National Security Agency analyst who blew the whistle on that trailblazer surveillance program. He was right. The program was in violation of American law and it wasted taxpayers' money. Not only did the NSA eventually drop Trailblazer, but the legal charges were dropped in a plea deal in which Drake pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor offense of misusing an NSA computer. The judge who issued that ruling said that what the Justice Department, that is to say the Obama administration did in this case, was unconscionable. Charging Drake under the Espionage Act, threatening him with a 35-year jail term, only to then drop the case shortly after the story was investigated by CBS News in 60 Minutes. Thomas Drake, a father of five, lost his job at the National Security Agency and his $150,000 a year salary. He now works at an Apple computer store in Washington.